tena koto katoa e mihi kau ini e mihi kau ana kite mana fenua o wai kato na mihi nui ka akatoa ko shifali pawa toko engwa he kai ranga hu ahu ite fare wananga o wai kato no enia aho no rera tena koto tena koto tena koto katoa ah Good afternoon and thank you for inviting us here today. My name is uh, Shifali Pawar and I work as a senior researcher with the National Institute of Demographic and Economic Analysis or NIDIA as we call ourselves and we are situated within the uh, one of the institutes uh, in the University of Waikato. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some of the key demographic changes that have occurred and are expected to occur across uh, New Zealand and its sub-regions and some of the implications of these changes that we need to consider. And as Stephen said, he, when I asked him, is there any particular areas you want to uh, focus on? And he said, you know, the whole of New Zealand. And I was trying to figure out. So what I have done is I've just taken uh, one or two regions which stand out a little bit more than the rest of the regions and who have more rural areas within them. Uh, to uh, talk about some of the changes. So I hope that you find it useful. And as I said, if there is a f a further information that any of you need for any of the other regions that you are associated with, I'm more than happy to uh, send that to you. So, so let's look at the big picture first. Now, globally, many countries are uh, celebrating agglomeration and the uh, economies of scale that are provided by the emergence of large urban centers. But side by side, we are experiencing <coughs> uh, widespread uh, and it is accelerating and seemingly self-reinforcing rural population decline. Now, it is well recognized that uh, population zero growth and depopulation are uh, widespread at the national as well as the sub-national level in uh, Japan, most of Europe, and many developed countries. In fact, a world uh, report has uh, come up with the finding that this trend of depopulation and the stopping of population growth is well underway in many developing countries as well. So many countries have gone into the state of natural decline, which is where, where we, it's a state where you have more deaths than births. Now, moreover, population is aging. Now, the population aging phenomena is happening everywhere. Fertility rates are dropping. So either they are dropping or they're remaining constant, but they're not increasing. And most importantly, all these changes that are happening across the globe are irreversible. And now we have got another factor to take into account, and that's the COVID pandemic. Now, the COVID has introduced a whole lot of uncertainties around migration flows. And these are still unfolding, and uh, only time will tell uh, how that is all going to settle down to in terms of migration and population changes. So what's happening in New Zealand? Now, New Zealand is a microcosm of what's happening everywhere around the world. Now, New Zealand's growth rate has, uh, has been, uh, is still been around the global average. So we, uh, New Zealand has had uh, relatively higher birth rates, although now uh, our birth rates have fallen below the replacement level. So the total fertility rate, in, if to have a minimum, uh, uh, the replacement level as we call it is 2.1. So you should have 2.1 births per women. And the latest data of 2020, New Zealand's birth rate has gone down to 1.6, which is the lowest ever recorded in New Zealand. So our rates have gone down. But we have had higher uh, birth rates for a long time compared to our counterpart countries. Uh, moreover, we have, we have very high uh, international net gain per capita. And New Zealand had the much higher and longer baby boom than any other country in the world. So together, these factors have shielded New Zealand so far from the advanced structural aging and depopulation that can be seen in many counterpart countries. So we are essentially, I mean, it's, uh, we are essentially moving from an old form of population decline where migration was the main cause of population declining to a new form of decline where migration is accompanied by natural decline, which is more births than deaths, uh, more births, uh, more, sorry, more deaths than births. So we are growing at the national level, but underneath rural depopulation is widespread, it is increasing, and population projections show that this trend is going to continue. Now, at the same time, the growth in our super city, Auckland, 
uh, which is about 35 percent of the national growth is happening in Auckland. It conceals most of the uh, many uh, uh, changes, population changes, compositional changes that are taking place around uh, uh, New Zealand, and especially in small rural areas. Now, population is becoming older. It's becoming more diverse. And uh, now in rural areas, rural areas have traditionally always lost young people to out-migration. And now this um, loss of young people is accompanied by a massive increase in the population of elderly. So, and uh, a thing which we need to take into consideration, when a region loses its young people, it reduces the reproduction potential of that region. And that uh, further accelerates the onset of aging. So in the new form of decline, as I said, net migration loss is uh, accompanied by and it further contributes to natural decline. Now depopulation, the end of growth, the population aging, these are all important factors that need to be taken into account, especially at the local level. So why is it important to look, up, look at all these factors? It's important, it matters, because it matters to people who own houses, who own businesses. It matters to uh, organizations that provide services and who are going to need a workforce to deliver those services. And last, but definitely not the least, we cannot have any population conversation without looking at the more, uh, crucial issue of inequality. We have massive inequalities in every single socio-economic indicator in New Zealand, be it justice, we've got training, education, health, home ownership, uh, occupation, industry, anywhere you look, there are in massive inequities everywhere. And population dynamics cannot be understood until we understand the broader context. So this is showing the uh, New Zealand population growth from 2006 to 2048. So that is a current population and then you have the uh, projected population. Now I just want to emphasize that pro population projections are not predictions or forecasts. We, they are just basically estimates of what the population would be provided the assumptions, the fertility, mortality, and the migration assumptions upon which they are based prevail. So tomorrow, if there is a big catastrophe or if there's a big policy change, those projections are all thrown out of the window. So they're as good as their assumptions are. Now, the medium series of projections are the most common and the most uh, likely scenario. And they assume medium fertility, medium life expectancy, and they assume a uh, um, to net migration, an uh, annual net international migration gain of 12,000 people. Now that is quite low than what we have seen in New Zealand in the past many years. Now, in, for example, in December 2018, we had a net gain of 48,000 uh, people coming into New Zealand. And the most recent period, it was uh, January 2021, we had 33,000, a net gain of 33,000 33, people. Now, what is interesting in this is that uh, historically, New Zealand has always had a net loss of New Zealand citizens and a net gain of non-citizens coming into the country. But now the situation is completely reversed because of COVID. We have, have more people, New Zealand citizens, returning home. So now we have, out of these 33,000, 63% are actually New Zealand citizens who are returning home, and the remaining are non-New Zealand citizens. So. Now, another, uh, another point before I move on is that the, what we have to take into consideration is that the permanent long-term mi migrants who come into the country are very unlikely to go and settle in the rural areas. So it's mostly going to be in urban centers they're going to uh, live in. And also that migration is a very strongly cyclic phenomena. And New Zealand in the coming years is going to have increasingly will need to compete with other developed countries for a small for the same small pool of young skilled migrants. So it's going to get more and more difficult to get migrants. So the natural uh, the national picture that I showed you it shows a 10 percent three 10.3 percent growth on uh, New Zealand in the future. So it's looking all positive, but underneath there is. Um, uh, it's not uniformly distributed. And so this 10.3% growth that we saw between 2013 and 2018, uh, in the last intercensor period, it's not uniform. So some regions and sub-regions are witnessing massive declines in population numbers. And this trend is expected to uh, continue. Now, I just before we uh, go into the detail, I just wanted to get uh, uh, 
I, I am sure many of you know it, but New Zealand, uh, for statistical uh, New Zealand purposes, the whole of New Zealand is divided into 16 regions. And then if you go into a smaller boundary area, they are divided, it is divided into 67 territorial authority areas, what we call as TA areas. And then if you want to drill down further, which is a, a, we, what we call a statistical area unit. So they are divided into SA1s and SA2s. So an SA2, for example, is uh, generally comprises of a, a homogeneous community or a community of interest of around 1,000 to 4,000 people. So these small SA2s make up the TAs, TAs make up the region. So that's the way we split, uh, we look at it geographically. So in, to, in the 2018 census, one out of the 16 regions in New Zealand declined, which is West Coast. Two, uh, two uh, TAs declined in population. And uh, if you drill down further, then 10% of the SA2 areas with, uh, over the country, uh, or about 2,000, uh, 2000, I think 2,049 or so TAs declined in, po in population numbers. And the population growth also varies immensely over these regions. So if you look at the regional level, uh, Southland had a growth of 5%, Bay of Plenty 15%, or if you look at the TA level, which is a lower uh, ge geographical boundary, 2% in Rua Peru and 43%. And so it's quite varied across the country. And we have to look at it at that level rather than just looking at the national picture. Because the, oh, as I said, oh, Auckland, 35% uh, of the nation's growth is concentrated in Auckland. 42% is spread across the rest of New Zealand, or uh, the rest of the North Island, and only 23% is uh, spread across the South Island, and that too mostly in Canterbury and Otago. So if you look at uh, uh, the sub-region, so I'm just taking Waikato region as an example. Waikato region is made up of nine uh, territorial authority areas. And if you see here, there's a 22% uh, overall growth projected for the region. But this growth is again very unevenly spread out and 85% of Waikato region's growth is only confined to three TA areas, Hamilton, Waikato and Waipa. In fact, Waitomo is expected to decline over the next 20 years. I was just having this conversation with Anne, I think, about the classifications. Now, when I spoke to Stephen, he was, I was asking him what, I mean, you're having a rural forum, so what is it that you define, what, you, what, what do you define as a rural area in New Zealand. There have been various definitions and for a small country we got a whole lot of various uh, definitions of rural urban. But we generally prefer to stick to the uh, statistics New Zealand definition of rural urban because in many ways it's quite useful because if you stick to or anybody sticks to these definitions, it's easier to then go and look at other data related to it because Statistics New, statistics New Zealand will then aggregate census data, all uh, 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 data from various uh, surveys on uh, to uh, uh, are disaggregated at this level. So if you have these kind of definitions similar to what Stats New Zealand uses, then it's much more easier to drill down into what you call a rural community because the definition would be the same. So uh, the latest definition which is going forward from 2018 census, uh, New Zealand divides, uh, sorry, Stats New Zealand divides New Zealand into six uh, areas. So four of them are urban. Uh, and from major, large, medium, small, depending on the density of the population and the presence of um, physical structures like hospitals, community centers, museums, libraries. So based on that, the, so if you, and then you have the rural settlements, which are basically a cluster of at least 40 dwellings, which have at least one physical structure like a hospital and have at least 200 to 1,000 uh, people living in it. And then the rest, whatever doesn't fit into any of these categories, comes as rural other. So there are 67 rural other uh, areas within uh, each of the, so, the, so each of the TA areas has got one rural other. And we have about 389 rural settlements. Uh, just to give an example, merge, major urban areas are, we just got about seven of them, Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, Wellington, Dunedin, uh, Christchurch uh, and Lower Hutt. And then we've got large urban areas which are like uh, Rotorua, Hastings, Napier, uh, New Plymouth, Inverkagil. So those are large. Then we've got a medium which is Pukekoe, Cambridge, Tiamutu, Morrinsville, Queenstown, Taupo. And then we have the small urban areas which are like Kerikeri, Coromandel, Fitianga, um, Taupo, no, not Taupo, sorry, Otoranga, Naruwaiya, and Morrinsville. So those are all small. And then we have those rural settlements and rural other. 
So if you look at the division of New Zealand uh, in terms of where these people live, so 52% of the New Zealand population lives in major urban areas. And then you have the remaining spread across the other three urban areas. And then 16% live in actually are as defined by Stats New Zealand as rural rural. So they are remote rural areas uh, which are not close to any urban area. So slowing down and the subsequent uh, ending of population growth is more or less a sequentially unfolding phenomenon. It doesn't happen overnight. So population uh, changes are ushering in what demographers known as uh, call uh, structural crossovers. So first there will be fewer labor market entrants uh, than exits. Then there will be more elderly than children. Then there will be a shrinkage of the reproductive age population. And finally, somewhere in between, we will shift from more births to more deaths. Now, these crossovers are already occurred, have already occurred in some TA areas in New Zealand and will continue to occur. Nothing is going to stop them now. Now, if the life expectancy increases to what has been, uh, what it is now, then the number of the population of elderly will increase and the crossover from more of more uh, elderly to, sorry, more children to more elderly will happen earlier. Or if by some miracle the fertility rate increases, then we'll have more children at, and that will slow down the onset of structural aging and this crossover of more elderly, uh, more children, from more children to more elderly will happen earlier, but only by a few years. So, the, and another thing that can, um, uh, another factor that can affect these crossovers is of course migration, but then again, migrate, it's unlikely to affect the rural areas because as I said, long term migrants where they come in, they are very unlikely to go and settle down in rural areas. So let us just look at one or some few of these uh, crossovers. So how many of, uh, how many people are entering the low labor force for every person who is exiting the labor force? So I've got this graph. So you got the ratio on the y-axis, which is uh, number of people who are getting ready to enter the workforce, 15 to 24 year olds, divided by the number of people who are getting ready to exit the workforce, which is 55 to 64. So if you look at the national picture, you see that it has been declining since 2001 and it's going to continue to either decline or remain constant. Uh, this is the overall trend, but let's look at Auckland, which is one of the younger areas. Auckland in 2001 had 1.7 people entering the workforce for every person exiting it. And now by 2038, we, uh, I mean, even as, as early as 2018, currently it has about 1.3 people entering the workforce for every person exiting it. And that's going to remain cons uh, similar over the next 20 years. If you look at Waikato, it follows the national trajectory again. Then you look at somewhere in the West Coast. Now, West Coast had one person entering the workforce for one person exiting it back in 2001. Currently, there are only six to seven people entering the workforce for every one person entry, uh, leaving it, uh, for every 10 people leaving it. So you got only six to seven entering for 10 people leaving. Again, Tasman, the same story. So I've just taken a few examples to show you. So this, uh, as again I said, the crossover is happening all over New Zealand. In uh, 2006, 25 of the 67 TAs had this crossover already happened. By, uh, and this is, a by, currently there are about 54 of the 67 TAs have more exits than entries into the law workforce. And it's just, by, I think by 2038, all TAs across New Zealand are going to have more exits from the workforce than entrants. So another crossover, more elderly than children. So for New Zealand, this crossover is going to happen in around 2025, which is only about four to five years time. And then if you look at White Auckland, which is one of the youngest area, that's really, it's possibly going to happen around 2030. And then you have the Waikato, similar to Waikato, uh, similar to the national trend around 2025. And then you have somewhere in the west coast, which is one of the older areas, and Tasman, where this crossover has already happened. So you already have more elderly than children in their populations. So again, as similar to the labor force exit entry ratio, you'll have more elderly than children, all 67 TAs by, the, uh, by 2038. So another thing to import, uh, <sighs> An important thing to remember is that aging-driven growth is not the same as youth-driven growth. So 
over the next two decades the new zealand population is going to increase but all the growth is concentrated at the older ages and this, looking at the waikato region for example so you have so 22% of the growth that is projected for waikato region 60 uh, 80% of that conceals an 80% increase in the population of elderly and the all other age groups combined are only going to increase by 11%. So that's the magnitude of the difference. So this is what we call as numerical aging. So th there are the number of elderly in the region, sub-regions are going to increase drastically. So young people are probably going to be an endangered species very soon. <laughs> and again, this numerical aging is happening all across and it's especially happening in many rural areas. So now that we have talked about population growth, let's look at the story about composition because now often population research gets quite fixated on uh, growth. So once we have gone through the demographic transition, then there is, um, the growth doesn't vary tremendously. Now New Zealand has already gone through um, its mortality transition, it's gone through its fertility transitions, our birth rates, our death rates are fairly stable and all the volatility that comes in New Zealand population is from migration. Now the growth or the end of growth um, are important factors. We do need to take that into consideration, but it's equally important to look at how the population is comprised and what are the changes that are likely to occur within that population in terms of composition. And what will that change mean for us as businesses, as planners, as, as a community? So one of the important com uh, compositional change is age. So I don't know if you looked at these dreaded age sex structures. We love them, but <laughs> a lot of people go cross-eyed when they see it. So basically, it's, it's what it's showing is that if every person in New Zealand is made to stand back to back, that's how it will look in, as, as per their age and sex. That's what it will look like. In 2006, this is what the age structure is. So a, a, a growth-driven or youth-driven age structure is in a pyramid shape where you have a big base and a, a small uh, tip. So if you start over here, New Zealand did more or less have a kind of a pyramid, but as the years go by, you can see the gradual thinning of that pyramid, and it is going from a pyramid shape to a more of a cylindrical shape. So the number of older people, for example, in New Zealand in 2006 was 12%, is going to go up to 22%. And same is the story in the Waikato. So, now here is the more youthful age structure in Hamilton city. So in Hamilton is one of the youngest TAs uh, in the country. Uh, now this wings that you see here are the student population in Hamilton. Now contrast this age structure with something like one of the oldest TAs in uh, New Zealand which is Thames Coromandel which is a completely what I call an upside down pyramid. So you have, uh, it, Thames Coromandel is rapidly moving towards this upside down pyramid shape. Two out of every five residents in uh, Thames Coromandel are going to be age 65 plus by 2038, which is quite a sobering thought. So now what is often overlooked in the discussion of migration, people talk about migration all the time, but when is that the age and sex characteristics of the migrants has a significant impact on the age sex structure of a uh, region. Not only the destination region, but also the origin uh, region, so where the people leave from. Because when young people leave, as I said, they take or decrease the reproductive potential of that area. So the impact of uh, years of youthful out migration, can you see West Coast? See over here, the bite you can see in that age structure is the youthful out migration of young people going out of west, uh, the West Coast. And then it has led to this gradual thinning of West Coast in 2018, and that's going to go worse, and it's going to become more of a sausage shape by the time it reaches 2018. So West Coast, uh, so the West Coast and Th Thames Coromandel, like many other sub-regions or rural areas, are moving from the old form of population decline. I know I keep coming back to this point, but it's quite something that you really need to keep in mind, that it's moving from the old form of population decline to new form where migration loss is accompanied by a natural decline. So it's happening both, they're getting hit from both sides. So they're having a migration loss and there is natural decline. So there's no possibility for them to grow. Uh, so and where, and but such aid structures like Thames Coromandel and Waste, Thames Coromandel is a great example of that. Even though it is, uh, 
aging rapidly and it's reached the end of growth it's still growing in terms of population that's because you have it's receiving an in migration of retired uh, people around the retiring uh, age so in one hand the population stops growing and it uh, but in, in the other hand it pushes it to the end of growth so it's happening at the end of growth and the onset of depopulation can happen quite rapidly quite quickly especially if too much attention is being paid to the bottom line that is the population size and not enough to the population composition which is really really important so another compositional change is ethnicity which is really important here for us in new zealand now the population growth projected for uh, all the four broad ethnic groupings which we have maori pacific islanders european and other including the non news uh, the new zealander group and the uh, asian group they are very different so and because of these differing growth rates the ethnic composition of the country is changing and there are these changes again vary across the regions now substantial growth is expected for the maori pacific and asian ethnic groups uh, so they are these groups are going to account for a growing proportion of new zealand population in the coming years and while the european slash other and new zealander population is declining in terms of proportion so it's going to account for a smaller proportion of the new zealand resident population now an important thing to note over here is that the uh, maori and pacifica dynamics are driven by fertility high fertility rates whereas the asian dynamics are driven by migration so this is what the new zealand comp uh, ethnic composition looks from past to the future so you can see a slightly increasing of the band for a uh, maori for pacific islanders asian and a s narrowing of the band for the european other groups same thing for auckland region which is one of the youngest it's highly diverse and is getting more and more diverse and then you have the waikato region you have gisborne everywhere you see the population of uh, asians pacific islanders and maori is increasing and then even if you take a region in the southland again it's the same story so you have an increasing population of the three ethnic groups and again as i said this trend is mirrored across new zealand and another real important thing that we need to take into account and some of you might have heard the word, the phrase dem demographic dividend or demographic gift as we call it the relatively youthful maori and pacific islander age structures sh have to be taken into account now the pyramid shape as i said signifies growth while the sausage shape on the right signifies the end of growth so current estimates show that half of the maori population and 57% of the pacific islander population is aged under the age of 25 and that's compared to only 32% among the european and other group now this dis these disparities very clearly show who is going to disproportionately make up the uh regions workforce or the country's workforce in the future so if you look at only the child population so when i say child i'm talking about the population of 0 to 14 year olds children who are our future workforce our future decision makers over the next two decades the number of um, the number and proportion of maori and pacific islander children is estimated to grow quite disproportionately across the country so this grow this graph i have just taken maori uh, for example so uh, this is the number of 14 0 to 14 year old children identifying as maori in new zealand so i can say there's an increase if you look at waikato region two out of every five kids by 2038 will be maori gisborne four out of five kids will be maori by 2038 and uh, even if you take and uh, Taranaki, two out of five, similar to Waikato, and then you take a region in the South Island, Canterbury, where again you see an increasing proportion of children who identify with the Maori ethnic group. So, in a region like uh, Gisborne or even Waikato, where a disproportionately high uh, number of children are Maori and Pacific Islanders, the success and well-being of the sub-region or the region is very dependent on the success and well-being of its Maori and Pacific Island communities. so increasing access to education to training for young maori and pacific uh, islander uh, children is of critical importance not just for the um, not just to build the social capital and well being for these populations but to build the social capital and uh, well being for the region as well as the country as a whole 
another uh, important uh, compositional uh, difference that we have to take into account is that there is a growing proportion of overseas born people so uh, over the last uh, from 2006 to 2018 this increase as you can see is across all regions there's a much higher proportion of people who reported being born overseas another important character is characteristic of the population is the growing number of temporary migrants now these what i'm showing you are population counts so i don't want to get into too much technicality but there is a visa count and there's a population count because there are people apply for visas with immigration new zealand some get approved some get declined so you have the visa approval data and then you have the actual data of people who are in the community working as temporary migrants on work visas or on a student visa studying so the number of uh, so and these are monthly numbers that's why the curve is so smooth because it's quite cyclic but if you just take the monthly numbers it comes out to a smooth curve so the number of people on work visa in new zealand has more than doubled over the last 20 years from late 2000s to early covid before covid now and there has been some growth in the student population as all well. the dip down is after covid and most importantly this change is occurring across new zealand it's not just confined to auckland So another one of my eight sex structures. Now this is the bars in the, the non-colored graphs is the census, the whole New Zealand, whole of New Zealand in 2013 and 2018. Um, usually resident population, and what I have superimposed on it is the age sex structure of the temporary migrant population. So as you can see, there the temporary migrant population is not only increasing; it's very young. Majority of them are in their 20s and 30s. So if you look at the age structure in 2018, you can see that around 20% uh, of them are, uh, so one out of every five people you meet who are in their 20s is a temporary migrant who is in the country either on a student visa or a work visa. One out of five, that's quite a big number. And people don't realize how big it is until, I mean, I always get surprises when people say this. So, and again, as I said, in some areas it's going to be more and less, it's not uniform across the country. Another interesting graph is this one. So this is only talking about work visa holders. So we've taken all the approved. So this is not people. This is the uh, people apply. They get an approval. So these are all the approved work visa uh, visas that have been approved for work. So temporary essential skill workers. So uh, and then I've disaggregated it by nationality. I've just taken two regions just to show you. One is Waikato on the left and Southland on the right. So you will find that temporary work visa holders in different regions, including, so there are temporary work uh, visa in all different regions, including uh, there are uh, significant rural uh, regions with significant rural areas like uh, Waikato and Southland. Uh, but uh, but the, the nationality makeup of this temporary migrant force can be very different from region to region. So if you see over here, the significantly high proportion of the work visa holders in the Southland region come from Philippines probably due to the farming uh, industry and but it's much more balanced in the Waikato where it's not that stands out but another thing which you really need to take into account that this is only the principal applicant so this is when I say 4,000 it's only the person who's applied for the visa most in many cases each of these migrants come with their families they come with their partner with their children so the actual number of uh, Philippines temporary migrants in Southland for example is going to be much higher than 4,000 I have sketched out the major population changes projected for New Zealand and the regions, both in terms of size and composition. So and that's what we do as population researchers. However, how to respond to these changes has to be locally driven by people who actually live and work in the community. So I'm just going to take a couple of uh, areas uh, to just show you that some of the implications of these changes on the labor market. So let's take the all important health workforce. Now, along with the increase in the elderly population, which in turn will put an pressure on the health system in terms of demand, the health workforce is also aging, as you can see here, and that's going to affect the supply. Uh, and again, this is going to be more of an issue in rural areas. Now, the changing ethnic composition of the population is also very important. Maori, Pacific, Asians are going to make up a growing share of the population, especially at younger ages. And healthcare providers are going to need to be more proactive 
in terms of supporting and delivering services, keeping in mind the cultural needs of these uh, groups. And of course, the all important education and training center. So that is aging as well. So we're going to face the problem of, we already are, and we're going to continue to face the problem of teacher shortages. I've just taken, this might be of interest to some of you, so I've just taken the religion data from the census, just to give you an idea. So religion, uh, religious affiliation is a self-identified uh, association of a person with a religion uh, or a denomination or a sub-denomination between the religious groups. So no list is, so in the census form, there's no drop-down list or anything. They just ask you a simple question, what is your religion? And they give you only three options. One is to write down your religion in a box or you have to say that you don't have a religion, which is no religion is an option. And the third option is object to answering. So you can either object to answering the question or you can say you don't have a religion or you can actually r spell out the religion that you belong to or affiliate with. And you can affiliate with more than one religion. Now there is an increasing trend of people who have chosen the no religion option. So it's in uh, 2018, we had almost half of the population said that they do not associate themselves with any religion. And that's up from 29% in uh, 2001. And, uh, and with the people who are affiliating themselves with at least one religion, the majority of them, of course, identified with the Christian uh, and 15% were Anglican. And uh, the top five, for, take the top five TAs of the people where uh, the people have chosen no religion as uh, an option. Uh, oh, sorry, if I take the top five TAs where a person has chosen one religion to affiliate with, at least one religion, all five of them belong in the South Island. So starting from Queenstown Lakes, where at least 61% of the population has uh, identified themselves or associated themselves with one religion. Now, of the people who have chosen to affiliate themselves with a religion, I have spelled it out, there are 100, and it's quite a big group, it's about 157 affiliations, categories that people have chosen. And among the most recently added re religious affiliation categories, the largest number is the, I mean, this is a new one for me as well, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. <laughs> I don't know who would take the pains of writing all that, but uh, 4,250 people have actually written down the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. And then the Church of, Church of Jedi, as you know, that's about 20,500 people have identified with the Church of Jedi. So just some key home, take home messages before I end. So as I said, it is important to look at sub-regional changes projected as overall changes hide uh, declines and changes in many sub-rural areas, especially within a district. A lot of sub-regions across New Zealand are facing population, uh, end of population growth, depopulation, and preparation of what is to come is the key to uh, countering this. Now, population, are, uh, population changes are ushering in what demographers call structural crossover, so more elderly than children, more fewer labor market entrants and exits, and then the shift between from more births to more deaths. Now, not only the population size, but it's crucial to take into account the compositional changes that are occurring at the sub-regional level. So, Maori, Asian, Pacific Islanders, increasing uh, growth, uh, po uh, increasing share of the population, especially among young, younger ages. And again, as I said, service providers and planners are going to be more pro proactive about uh, delivering services or creating services, supporting these cultural needs of these groups. And local challenges always are better to have local solutions. And a big opportunity, which I'm going to end with, is the youthful Maori and Pacific Islander population. So it's a demographic dividend or a gift that we can capitalize on. The number and proportion of young people in New Zealand is shrinking, but within that decline, there is a increase in the share of Maori and Pacifica children. It's just getting bigger and uh, their visibility is getting more. And it's more important that we focus on providing all the right opportunities for those groups as for not only the region, but as a country as a whole. That's it from me. Ko hmm. Frank Scrimger Toko No No Pakawa Tita Ihu No 
Kotorana, Switzerland, me in Horangi Oku Tapuna. Ko Areri, Toku Awa. Ko Burnett, Toku Monga. Kiti, Nohu, Oke, Kiri Kiri Roa. Foko Mori, Matiati, Ioha. Thank you, Stephen, for um, the invitation. It is an honour to be here, and I acknowledge my own uh, personal debt, family debt, uh, to the Anglican Church, and uh, directly and indirectly through your contribution uh, to our university and the nation as well. Before I get down to uh, the work that I'll put on the table, I'd like to honour your Papa, to the extent that I have my head around it, but I uh, appreciate your um, your spiritual passion, ministry, and service. But uh, the fact that that's linked with intellectual engagement, um, uh, none of us at the university uh, understands everything that we need to know, and so we're happy to have uh, partners in the community. So. Um, <coughs> Motivation for what, I'd, uh, what I'm going to present today, I'm not going to do the standard bank economist uh, talk. Um, I'm trying to provoke you to think about what you observe in the rural uh, society and economy which we um, interact with, even though many of us don't live in it. I do hope to put on the table um, some information which I hope is accurate, but I'm in some senses more interested in what could be, what can be in the future. And it seems to me that's not just determined by the choices of business people and uh, labour and politicians. Um, there's lots of participants in that uh, process. My approach is... Uh, descriptive, you'll see um, various things which you could uh, regard as anecdotes, but they are not randomly selected. They are, they are part of constructing an interpretation of what's going on. I uh, put a little picture there um, to signal that I've been thinking about these things, dare I say it, for um, I'll just say more than 50 years and leave it at that. Um, and, uh, you know, I have compelling memories of um, people uh, sitting around debating the impact of one farthing on a pound of milk fat and what it would mean for um, their incomes. And so I resolved uh, before I was very old that I was uh, going to go to Wellington and talk to some of those people that um, I only heard criticised in the wool shed, the cow shed and a few other places. And, and it did happen and I was surprised how much some people in Wellington actually knew. However, I want to um, remind myself and to remind you that rural and regional are not exactly the same. And you'll be aware of that, but just think about Southland for a minute. If we, talk, if we get Southland statistics and then we think about uh, Queenstown, right? Queenstown is quite different from many other parts of Southland. And so we just need to be always walking this tension and, and sometimes you'll find that I use the wrong word in my descriptors, but um, please forgive me um, in, in, the, in the verbal presentation, but certainly when we write, we need to be accurate about this. Um, to me, the uh, important thing is that rural is non-urban, right? That, that's, that's the key thing from my perspective. But of course, there are gradations of being 
rural and um, in many ways we tend to use distance as, as a guideline for our classification systems. So, so we're talking about what's going on in non-rural parts of the country. But what is the economy? I mean, some people will go to great uh, lengths to point out to us that it's just a construct that we use to help us interpret what's going on. But uh, I um, would suggest that it's helpful to think about um, a set of activities that uh, are going on which generate incomes and impose costs where there are assets and liabilities and um, and people and organisations and institutions interact, make choices which determine those outcomes. Um, the self-reliant individual rural person is not as individual and influential as they think, but neither is the, you know, Minister of Agriculture or Minister of Finance or something as influential as they think. You know, there's this interplay between different agents as we talk about them in economics um, and their impacts play out. And I'd emphasise that even within institutions and organisations, um, people are important. And I have there a, a picture of a a rural man. He's not any rural man, but he's a man from my childhood. And um, I remember him speaking with uh, strong opinions on one occasion. And at the end, when challenged, he said, well, sometimes I even disagree with myself. And, and I think, uh, you know, that is part of the, the conversation that we have to have if we're going to, to learn. And so I honour the memory of Graham. It's very easy for those of us who live in urban environments to um, think that we have control of systems to achieve uh, our outcomes. And I just... Um, plot here a couple of grass growth curves. In fact, I didn't plot them. I stole them, you could say. I took them from uh, another publication. But just to say that the grass doesn't grow at the same rate every week of the year. And so the whole challenge, if you like, is to take advantage of when there's plenty and to find ways to cope when there's not much. And I suggest to you that it, this is not just a phenomena in relation to pastoral farming. You know, it's very much true of most rural activity. You know, you don't go fishing every day of the year and catch the, you know, the same amount of fish and leave at the same time and go home at the same time. You know, there's this interaction with the biophysical world in which we live. And the economy has to uh, cope with that and um, and people have to cope with that. I'd like to emphasise the place of Maori in the rural economy. Often um, they have been neglected in um, public documents and conversations but I suggest They've always been uh, very uh, visible at a local level. Whether or not they've always been equally respected is another matter. But I just want to um, remind you of their significance in the rural area and the fact that they are significant landowners and that through time, much more of that land is being economically productive and um, influential and, and, it, and as it uh, generates income it not only uh, directs the funds back to the beneficiaries 
it leads to other opportunities. And you can think of the likes of the Miraka Dairy uh, uh, factory uh, in the South Waikato, where you have um, iwi owners connecting with uh, offshore Vietnamese uh, um, partners to achieve uh, things that they couldn't do um, as a subsidiary of Fonterra or, or something else. They are an important uh, contributor to the rural workforce. I'll come back to that again later. And they are a significant um, player in policy conversations. The Federation of Maori Authorities is very important now. And um, and this um, contributes to a much uh, richer debate about uh, possibilities and options going forward. And incidentally, I, I would say over the years I've um, done a number of projects for um, Maori entities, and I just um, have to acknowledge that I've felt um, more respected in my work and those responsibilities than I usually feel when I do work for Her Majesty's government departments. Um, and I just think, you know, the rest of us can learn from that when an outsider comes in and engages. It, it's really nice to be um, welcomed and respected and appreciated. So thanks to uh, many people. Uh, some of you will be uh, familiar uh, with uh, Wakatu Incorporation in, in Nelson and the work that uh, they are doing and have done and uh, I've enjoyed having, shall I say, very small connections there amongst others. So what's the rural economy like? Isn't the economy the same everywhere? Well, I suggest to you, no. The rural economy depends on a, a very limited range of activities. You know, we tend to think of economies as, you know, primary industry, you know, farming, mining, fishing kind of stuff. We think of secondary industry, you know, manufacturing, and tertiary as in services. And, you know, the traditional economic history that most people get exposed to, you know, any progressive nation starts off um, primary sector, becomes more secondary, more tertiary, and then we're all uh, accountants and insurance brokers and rich and happy. Um, I, I suggest to you that that is um, not a helpful narrative to tell. Um, services, manufacturing, Primary industries fit well in different places for different reasons at different times, and how they fit together is important. But it does have its constraints that rural areas are primarily dependent on primary industry activities. And they experience significant income fluctuations. I'll give you some figures um, later on in this presentation, but I observe you know, in the more than 30 years I've worked for the University of Waikato, my salary has never gone down. You know, it may have been flat at times, but, you know, there's been a, a steady, reliable income, you know. I can debate my level of satisfaction with it, but that's, but it's always been there. Whereas rural economies go up and down. There's significant dependence on the land. And we have to take account of that in, in many different ways. But, you know, for, you know, you can be an accountant, you can be a filmmaker, you can, many things you can sort of do anywhere. But if you're going to be in a rural area and make a living, it's going to have strong linkages to land and water. There are low levels of services in the rural economy. If you want to read uh, a disparaging statement about healthcare in the rural areas, we'll read the Simpson report. 
you know, it's it's there in black and white. It's not just uh, Waikato University, you know, pushing for a, a medical school. There is a real need. And even Otago University, bless them, today I see uh, starting to fundraise for a professor of rural health. Well, it's overdue. The state is pretty invisible in rural areas. Uh, we see the primary schools, they are visible. Some roads are state highways, they are visible. Um, the Department of Conservation is visible in some places. But beyond that, the state is very invisible to many people in their daily lives and in their economic choices. And I suggest that uh, that has impacts on the way they, how rural people behave. There's the tyranny of distance. Down the bottom, you probably can't see very uh, clearly, but from Ruatoria to Tauranga, um, Google Maps tells me it takes five hours and 24 minutes. I just remember it took me a long time. Um, but what I s say is this tyranny of distance is not just a cost of a motor vehicle and petrol or fuel. There's that time component of um, distance and travel which is very significant and we need to grapple with. But I do suggest to you that there is a different quality of life in um, rural areas. I suggest to you it's, it's not all hard and doom and gloom and, and it's very important for those of us who are not part of those rural communities to understand uh, what residents participate, um, residents interpret as, as blessings and things that give them satisfaction and joy and meaning in their lives. But of course, um, we don't come to the table to think about the economy and the numbers um, with a blank sheet of paper. Uh, we come with uh, perceptions which we bring from our past. Some have seen the rural sector as just being a farm for Europe, a farm to uh, uh, satisfy their needs, or a producer of excess labour. You know, we need to get manufacturing going in New Zealand. We can't just rely on importing everything. Where can, where can we get some cheap labour from? We can pull it from the rural sector. Or perhaps it's uh, just a place to rehabilitate soldiers that we don't have a place for when the war is over. Perhaps it's... Perhaps we have beneath the surface some more romantic views about uh, the tough uh, totterers that come from the rural sector, um, whether it be the Ian Kirkpatricks that I've uh, pictured, dare I say an idol from my youth, um, or, or leaders in other places. But I suggest to you that um, in many parts of society, more leaders have arisen out of rural communities than urban communities than you would expect. Than you would expect. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon, and the sociologists and others may give us some reasons why that is the case. I would ob observe, uh, from my own experience, just one small observation that when you uh, a child in a small rural school, you have to interact with every child in that school. Fast or slow, which was probably the most uh, important uh, characteristic, uh, you know, smart or not so smart, you know, whatever the dimensions, so that it seems to me there are some relationship competencies that are facilitated uh, some of the time. 
we may think of, you know, the romantic pictures, particularly from Europe, of the rural idyllic romantic community. We may think of the backbone of the country producing all those exports that allow us to buy TVs and cars and other things in exchange. Or we may consider the, the rural area the home of country bumpkins. And I suggest to you that many of us are impacted by many of these different stories, multiple stories at the same time. So much for the storyline. What does the rural economy contribute? If I go to the second bullet first, I'd say it contributes a very small proportion of national gross develop GDP, small contribution. But um, it does have, you know, so we're talking less than 10%, perhaps 5%, you know, small. But those linkage, that activity has linkages to a lot of other sectors in the economy and it is a very important source of export revenue. Primary industries still provide um, over 60% of New Zealand's exports. You know, whatever way you measure it, somewhere between 50 and 75% is the share of our exports which come from primary industries. Now, of course, we note that they are a mixture of what's produced on the fishing boat and the farm and whatever, and in the factory, and, you know, there's other steps. So I'm not attributing that all to the rural economy, but it is, uh, it is very significant. And what um, many of us don't realise is that our level of exports has a significant effect on our exchange rate. And so... In, and the stronger our exchange rate, the greater ability we have to purchase imports, our greater purchasing power. So that exchange rate effect is, is something which is important. Um, I suggest to you the rural sector provides significant care of uh, natural capital. Three years ago, I... Uh, led a small team and we wrote a report for the QE2 Trust on the economic um, contribution of private individuals to conservation activity. It was very significant. We presented our report at Parliament buildings. I, I don't want to disparage the Department of Conservation. One of my own brothers is a long-serving uh, manager in the department, but what I uh, would suggest to you is, is that there's private sector activity which is complementing what's happening through uh, the government agency. But I suggest to you that the rural economy is not just producing income which sustains families, households, whatever. I, said, I ask you to think about the, the churches, the marais, the sports clubs, the not-for-profits that have uh, made very significant contributions, uh, that have received very significant contributions from rural areas. I um, um, spent a decade on the board of World Vision New Zealand. I um, saw information about where donations came from. I've observed this in other places and sure it's not true in all places all the time but I think there is a very important legacy there and you know part of the question is as, uh, as the cycles go round is um, what flows might go the other way at different points in time. I just put up some income statistics that I took from Beef and Lamb New Zealand just to show um, some real numbers in terms of farm incomes and their influence. So, so if you see uh, 
a hard hill country farm from the north of uh, the country with the average one has about 3,000 sheep and 500 cattle worth 6 million sounds quite a lot but if you look uh, down the bottom of it and you see the profit generated 142,000 for which to take a living and pay your borrowings you've got 2% to pay with um, and that's that 2, 2.5% two is pretty much what it's been for the last 50 years. Um, if you look at the South Island High Country, a quite different kind of situation, larger operations, uh, fine wool sheep. Um, again, the numbers are there. I'm keen for you to sort of feel the heterogeneity of the experience of different participants. So it's one thing to s talk about the good things, but what's the, the downside of the rural economy? Well, it's costly to provide in infrastructure. You know, it's, it costs a lot to maintain roads and put in uh, utilities to distant places. Having said that, I think we do need to rethink that a little when we realise how much it's costing to refit the infrastructure into Auckland at a later date, or yet to do in Wellington. Um, and also, some technologies um, are reducing the cost significantly. You know, we don't have to put in um, hundreds of kilometres of power lines to some places now for a very few customers. We can use wind power. So, but even so, infrastructure will always be expensive. And then, of course, there's environmental degradation, which comes with activity. Um, you can see the picture showing uh, the soil particles in the ocean off the east coast after a significant storm. I don't think we need to um, emphasise that story. I believe you know it well. But then it's not just the challenge of providing um, government services. If you can think about uh, private services, you know, the dilapidate, dilapidated bank sign, you know, shows the bank is long gone. And the question is how does the... Uh, economy function in a world without that service and where internet, ac uh, internet connections are not reliable. <coughs> so we, we've got these strengths, we've got these uh, um, costs, so the challenge is to find a sustainable path forward. And of course, if it's to be sustainable, it's going to have to address the economic, cultural, social, environmental matters. You know, none of them can be addressed in isolation. But what I would say to you is that there are multiple sustainable pathways, but some of them are not very attractive. So, so, so the word sustainability doesn't solve all our problems. You can be sustainably poor. Um, we may not want um, economic wealth to be the, the key driver, but we need to work out how we navigate our path. I suggest we need a path that is uh, resilient, that can cope with the shocks. I've talked about these vagaries. And it also needs to be Efficient. Well, it, it doesn't have to be efficient. That's my value judgment. But I um, value more of the things that I want relative to the cost that I have to pay in terms of things that I don't want. So that's, that's all that I'm meaning by efficiency. I, I think it's useful to recognise pathways that, where there are economic drivers. And so I comment there. You can have 
export production from a rural community with small, a small retail sector, right? But you can have a big, but you can't have a big retail sector if you've got minimal export activity. You know, one facilitates the other, and so we have to face up to that challenge. I've said there are multiple pathways that can be sustainable, and um, you know, what's the best kind of agriculture? Well, in some places, it may just be a quiet life with some chooks. But we need to be careful about assuming everything needs to be a highly productive uh, sheep farm or everything needs to be a you know alternative kind of little activity people have different preferences different needs different stages of life there's lots of things in play and uh, we have the opportunity to participate in conversations uh, politically uh, and socially and in, in many other ways. I do want to um, comment about this issue of shocks, droughts and floods. When Ever we have a significant drought in New Zealand, and we've been having them at least since my childhood, because I can remember listening to the news discussing them, but I believe they were occurring before that. Um, but you know, Reserve Bank studies show that um, in the years we have a significant drought, we, we lose about a, a third of our national growth and in income. You know, so this is a significant effect across the country. And of course, it's much more devastating to those that are impacted more directly. You can think about the significant floods. Um, uh, the picture is from the Rewalka Valley, um, down near my home country. Um, you know, the the damage to the landscape with slips, you know, the damage on the on the flats is is orchards and other land as roads and bridges and fences are damaged. So these are shocks that occur. We can think about pests and diseases. Um, in Bovis, you you may have read just uh, in the last few weeks about. Um, a very large farming enterprise um, being bankrupted as a result of uh, imbovis. Well, you might not be very sympathetic to, shall I say, the rich and the powerful, so I put the, the headline about the share milker losing everything. You know, a young couple starting out on their career wiped out by a disease. We can think about the PSA in the kiwi fruit, some of you may remember the disease that occurred there. You probably uh, can't see the the details in the slide here, but in the 2013-14 year, gold kiwi fruit production was halved. I myself am indirectly involved in that industry. Um, we decided that we would find a way to keep our staff because. You know, we, we hoped there was another side to this. We grew uh, squash and for, for a year. We still lost money, but we didn't lose as much money. And we, we had enough money to um, be able to keep going. And when we got to the other side, our, our, our core staff were still employed. But, you know, they, those kind of shocks keep you awake at night. I looked at uh, 20 years of milk price payments um, in New Zealand, average dairy cooperative milk prices. The average variation from year to year was 22%. So that's an absolute value, so it could be up or down, so 22%. 
one year milk prices were 45 percent lower than the previous year on another year they were 50 percent higher and of course we know about supply chain breakdowns you know I, I was brought up on the history of my father's wool being left on the wharves because of a strike and missing the Korean wool boom. But uh, and, and in the last 12 months we've seen people distressed by product uh, stuck on wharves in China. Move on to the shocks just to reflect a little bit about these connections between different parts of uh, the economy. In the dairy industry between 2014 and 2017, I only chose that period because it was an easy place for me to get some data, um, the industry invested over $2 billion in new equipment and plant upgrades. So there was 16 projects that were larger than 25 million. I suggest to you they um, involved a lot of expenditure supporting tradespeople and others in rural or semi-rural locations. I have up there some other numbers about the linkages associated with the kiwi fruit industry. Um, it's 2015-2016 uh, data and, and it's um, taken from some work that I did analysing the impact or potential impact of new kiwi fruit varieties. But at that point in time, if we take the, the left-hand column in terms of the revenues, there was about uh, $2 billion of um, revenue coming into um, the Bay of Plenty, about a billion directly to kiwi fruit growers, and another billion um, to other commercial players. Um, and then as that money was respent, there ended up being another billion dollars of expenditure associated with the expenditures of those firms and those households which received money from the industry. So there are these linkages, and I tell you, um, local government loves uh, these kinds of reports which show the economic impact of field days, rugby stadiums, uh, kiwi fruit uh, varieties or anything else. Changes in the rural economy. Just to sh show that over the last, uh, or well, the decade between 2009 and 2019, sheep numbers d declined by 15%. Beef cattle by seven, dairy was up by eight. So um, when you consider that uh, in the late 1970s, when I worked for the predecessor of beef and lamb, um, you know, the sheep flock was over 60 million, and now we're under 30. Um, but it's important to take uh, a long-run view. If we think about our largest export sector in 1953, it was wool. 1983, it was red meat. Uh, 2013, it was dairy. And every year I ask my students to predict what it will be in 2043. And they come up with ideas like international education and tourism and forestry and all kinds of things. We will see. But what I suggest is that there is significant change through time and part of the challenge is for the rural community and for the rest of us, if you like, to roll with the punches and navigate uh, the opportunity set that is put in front of us. But these changes are not costless. Um, you can see how from 1950 up to the late 70s, you know, sheep numbers and wool production went up, and it's 
been going down ever since. And if you wonder why it's been going down, we'll look at the real price of wool. If you just look at the red line. Um, you know, so high there that I couldn't even get it on the graph. Um, but it's just been going down uh, in these days. It's, um, it's said that shearing is basically an animal health activity rather than an income generating activity. Now I want you to think about this a little bit more in terms of an economic sense. Who are the people who shear the sheep? Who are the Rouseys and wool handlers? I suggest to you there is a very high percentage of Maori participation in those activities. That has been costly. Likewise, in terms of uh, employment in the meat industry, meat processing industry, again, um, with the reduction in the size of the lamb crop, you know, this has had a big impact on the employment opportunities uh, for um, particularly people with limited educational qualifications. A few more pictures about uh, changes. If you um, if you look, uh, that is a line about the number of dairy farms. Um, when Fonterra was formed, you know, you were over fourteen thousand dairy farms. You're under ten thousand now. And if you take out, if you add together the number of individual families or entities that have multiple supply numbers, um, it's even less. So what? And as we, the same time as that, we see um, the number, the average size of herd of cows um, going from just over two hundred to over 400, it's doubled. You know, that's, that's the average herd size. Many herds, I think the average in Canterbury is just under 1,000. I think the average in Southland is over 1,000 now. So much bigger in the South Island. But, so th those are just numbers, but, but what I say to you is that that makes it much harder for new people to enter the industry because you've you've got to accumulate a larger deposit, etc. You know, we we talk a lot, and rightfully so, about the challenges of <coughs> young adults buying houses in the current economic environment. I suggest to you there's similar kind of issues in the rural community, whether it's funding um, um, a log hauler or a fishing boat or a farm. Um, of course, if we look at the technology coming into harvesting logs now, fewer employment opportunities. Okay, it's bringing some health and safety gains and that's really great. But... Um, it does mean that um, you tend to have, um, shall I say, urban or quasi-urban workforces coming out, participating in an extractive activity and disappearing back to town again and not being part of a rural community. Similarly, I don't know if any of you have had the chance to go through the likes of uh, the big Litchfield dairy factory um, in the South Waikato. I've been through that uh, plant, it's very large. It's hard to find a person to talk to. It is so automated. So we have, um, you know, milk being transported long distances to big facilities, so we don't have the small dairy factories 
where the people work there and contribute to the local community. Um, the graph on the right hand side at the bottom is just to show that over 50 years maize yields have doubled in New Zealand. So it's not surprising the mix of uh, food which livestock are fed has changed through time but of course that tends to have uh, potential other costs. We shouldn't remain wedded to the past. There are new things happening. You can uh, grow some, you can eat some new red kiwi fruit. Um, they're in commercial production now, though they're not into exports yet. You can, um, instead of cutting down your manuka trees, you can plant some more and harvest honey. You can uh, take your horses for rides with tourists, there are different things that are happening. I suggest there's lots and lots of examples that I can give, but none of them are big volume earners um, or big providers of employment. I'd like to move on to talk about trends um, in rural institutions. In the first one that I'd comment on is smaller family sizes. Um, and that smaller family uh, size means that there's less um, immediate family and less cousins and others around to um, provide uh, friendship and support. It also makes asset uh, transfer between generations more problematic. You know, if you know a rural family has one or two children and one goes to work offshore and one goes to a big city and there's no one left at home and then what happens? Well, you know, the good thing is that an asset can transition to someone who really wants it, but there's often a lot of angst and challenge in that space. We can think about our cooperatives. You know, we can be, uh, we can puff out our chests and say, look, we've got some of the most successful cooperatives in the world. But we can also ask the question as to what difference is uh, Fonterra to a private equity firm. There are few local meat and dairy processes. It impacts our communities. Um, institutions such as the Meat Board are no longer political heavy hitters. Up until the 1970s, um, producer board executives could, in essence, call the Prime Minister to a meeting. As late as, you know, 1978, I as a first year graduate could be uh, summoned to talk to the Minister of Agriculture before a, a budget to discuss a particular matter. Um, Featherston Street is not what it was. Um, Messy House, Pastoral House, um, are interpreted in a completely different light to the past. And in large commercial entities, think of Fonterra, they struggle to sustain their licence to operate. Even um, Zespri, who's done a much better job, still has big problems in that space. And of course, you know, the research institutions um, that from a rural vantage point often seem more interested in urban concerns than rural concerns. You know, they may have high, uh, highly trained researchers, but have they ever travelled as far afield as Gisborne, let alone Ruatoria? So, fluctuations. 
we don't need to spend long on this, but notice milk prices over a relatively short period. This is, uh, so we can look at cheese prices going between $2,000 and $5,000 a tonne and back and forth. It's no wonder there's an impact at meat price, I mean the milk price at the farm gate. Um, similarly, you can see the price for a standard YM grade lamb going between $70 and $140 a lamb. So these kinds of fluctuations impact people's choices, their emotions, their many, many things. And it's easy to think about it from one year to another year, but I, I put this other graph here, which is about how milk prices have changed during a season. And so each um, gives the price that uh, Fonterra announces at the start of the season, and, how, how, and then they announce a change, and then they announce another change, and then another change, and another change, and another change. And I note, for instance, that at one year, they, the forecast price was $4.10, and it ended up at being $6.08. One year it started at 6.75, and it ended up at 8.40. I guess farmers would have been happy those two years. Another year it started off as a prediction of 5.25, and it ended up at 3.90. So these these are big transitions within very short periods of time. Okay, I'd like to put out on the table several areas of, of angst. Firstly, angst in the political space about large rural electorates. I just put a map of the West Coast Tasman electorate and just think how long it would take to um, drive from one end to the other. Um, we can think about large territorial Authorities. Well, to me, there's nothing about largeness per se, but it's the dispersion and the ability to engage with elected leaders, political leaders, and officials. You know, this is a challenge, and how it's worked out um, has impacts on people's identity, feeling, choices, behaviour. Um, MPI is probably been appropriately adjusting in many ways, but it hasn't been successful in communicating with its rural constituency. It's perceived as an alien body by many people in the rural community. It's not just the institution, it's particular issues that cause angst. Um, Cleaning up our rivers and lakes is an important issue for pretty much everyone, particularly in the rural communities. But the challenge is, is how you do that. And so, for instance, uh, we've seen the government uh, walk back on it, some of its proposals in, in Southland. Um, they were told that their proposal wouldn't work but they pushed on anyway, and now they've had to revisit it. We've seen a proposal that was pushed through in the Manawatu, Wanganui area, which resulted in um, hundreds of landowners being non-compliant for a long period of time. And again, there's had to be a judge adjustment because the officials weren't prepared to go and prosecute all these people because they had come up with a system that didn't work. Now, you know, big changes are demanding and so the challenge is particularly for um, central government and regional government to work with different parties to achieve the goals that need to be obtained. Um, the picture on the right hand side comes from the Climate Commission's draft recommendations. And 
again, there's lots of things that we could uh, debate about their recommendations, but I just want you to think about how individual people perceive a recommendation. So if you see just this black line down the bottom, they're showing sheep numbers continuing to decline. Okay? And then look at uh, um, this line going up here, going up very steeply. That's uh, meat per animal. So, so, so the Climate Change Commission released this report which is saying, you guys are going to have less animals, but you're going to achieve a whole lot more. And you can imagine the angst that that causes. And, and it seems to me, I believe there's much more flexibility to change in farming systems than many people will uh, acknowledge. I've seen, you know, what happened in the 1980s. You know, transformation can come even where there is pain. But we do need to be careful about these um, conversations. Mm -hmm. Likewise, um, if we think about employment and, you know, the border closures, uh, mostly I tend to think about it uh, in terms of the fact that I have academics on my payroll who can't come and teach a class face to face. Um, but, you know, our government um, um, faces challenges in terms of who they mm -hmm. let into the country. We, most of us wouldn't want to swap jobs with the people making those decisions. But it's important for us to think how rural New Zealand interprets the decisions as to who's allowed to come and who's not. And when you look at um, the apples falling on the ground in Hawke's Bay at the moment, you wonder whether you wonder about that particular decision, but you wonder how it's interpreted relative to other alternative choices that can be made. Again, I, I'm not in, interested in having shots at particular ministers, but these are challenges that have to be addressed one way or another. And then I, I just want to talk a little bit more about social angst and its relation to productivity and an economy is not just about production, it's about consumption and consumption is about how you feel and what you choose to do. The costs of isolation are real and as um, you know communication expectations rise but family size and other factors uh, mean that there are smaller families in rural communities. Uh, there's a lot of social angst. I suggest it's partly about just the joy of living and being community, but it's also about having sufficient people to do the jobs of running the volunteer fire brigade and the school committee and the vestry and whatever else. I won't labour the point. I'd like to go to the issue of investment in rural communities because to me that investment tells me something about people's expectations of the future. And the graph on the left shows the ratio of um, the value of residential building consents in 2020 divided by what it was in 2020. Sorry, in, in 2000, 2020 divided by 2000, change of a 20-year a period. So the, in Waitomo district, uh, the ratio is two. So the value of work being uh, consented in 2020 was twice that of 2000. But if we take account of inflation, that probably means, you know, minimal change, whereas if we look, the ratio is higher in the other districts. So I s suggest there's some different experiences. But then I put here the value of residential building consents for the whole 20-year period. And you see 
over um, that period, Hamilton City's uh, residential building consents valued over 4,000 million, over 4 billion, right? Over the 20 year period. If you add Waipa and Waikato together, more than Hamilton, you know, so they, if you like, they're not really rural, rural, you know, the urban rural, they're, they're closer. But if you go back to Waitomo, it's only something, you know, less than 100 mil over the whole 20 years. So you can see Waitomo, Otrahonga, South Waikato, there's not much happening in preparation for the future. So that tells something about what people see their futures to be. So where am I ending up? I'm ending up in a positive frame in, in that I'm saying that Aotearoa seemingly has a resilient rural economy. It has some of the best productivity gains of, of the country. But its participants are feeling stressed. Hmm. It is an economy where production and consumption are shaped by the biophysical world. And that includes the fluctuations and shocks associated with it. It is an economy with significant wealth. and with significant incomes. But statistics reveal significant inequality. I'm sorry I haven't documented that in this presentation. It is an economy with environment, environmental and social foundations under pressure. Okay, there's these pressures. We need to do something about it. And yet I suggest there is low trust and confidence in public institutions. I also suggest to you it is an economy of opportunity calling for imagination as to what could be and commitment to make it happen. I bring the presentation to a close. I'm happy to take questions along uh, with my colleague and I also am happy if you want to take a break and if at some stage um, you would like me to type up onto uh, the screen uh, five specific questions but I hand it over to you Stephen. Thank you. Before we get carried away with any thank yous, this is an opportunity to put any questions that you might have to Shafali or to Frank. It's possible Frank is available to stick around and put his questions to digital paper. Shafali, I think... I'd be happy to stay for another 10, 15 minutes. Oh, you're amazing. Uh, you thank you as well. So there will be an opportunity over afternoon tea to perhaps put some of your uh, specific localised questions to Shafali or to Frank, but if you've got any general questions, Jo. Um, so Frank, I, um, you made a reference at one point to um, the 80s, and I'm thinking when we talk about the, um, the current issues that are causing stress around, particularly around ecology, climate change, water, some of those things, and the need to, ch to move into a different kind of paradigm in terms of thinking about how we farm. So I'm a farmer. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if there was a similar paradigm shift in the 80s and, and what we're seeing in the kind of some of the pushback at the moment is those farmers who lived through that change in the 80s who essentially had to move from, you know, the kind of farming lifestyle, farming as the backbone of the economy into, and now it has to be a business, and 
they're now at this point of going, well, we've done what you wanted us to do. We've been a business. We've we've intensified and done everything we had to do to become an economic model. And now you're telling us that actually we've we've done all this damage in the process. <laughs> you know. And I'm wondering if, if some of that is part of the dynamic of the pushback that we're getting at the moment. Because what I'm seeing in younger farmers in our area is a real optimism around the opportunities they see in front of them because they're coming in in a different place. Does that, do you think that's a fair? So, so, so firstly, just to declare, I spent all of the 80s outside of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, but I have um, studied them at length um, and published a few articles actually on the 80s reforms. But I do observe um, there is a, a generational challenge of how one responds to these kinds of shocks when uh, they come. And I guess I'd never really internalised how, how great those shocks are until I find myself um, in my mid-60s coping with shocks to the university system associated with COVID and found the potential to become reactionary myself um, rather than, you know, celebrating the change and the challenge and all the things that I used to do with uh, taking the risks with great enthusiasm. And so I, so I think part of the thing is helping generations, um, different generations to work together to address um, these kinds of um, paradigm shifts, etc. Happy to engage more about that offline. Andrew? Thanks for the presentation, Frank. Uh, this is a little bit of curiosity, but also looking for a bit of a story of resilience. You mentioned your own engagement with kiwi fruit and the impact of the PSA, and then moving through the squash to keep things rolling. Did you then make a recovery, and how did that occur? I'll say. The recovery occurred, but I think in our situation, for, fortunately, we had both kiwi fruit and dairy operations. And in essence, the dairy kept us going when the kiwi fruit was hungry, and um, and then that that was the that was what saved us. I, I think our diversified portfolio, and that's sort of one of the challenges in. Um, in every form of agriculture. I know in my own doctoral work in dryland agriculture in a different part of the world, um, you know, there was a 50% probability of a new farmer going broke within five years. But if they survived the five years, um, they, were, they had a high probability of success. And, and so I think that um, that challenge of getting the right mix of sticking to your knitting, knowing what you're doing, being specialised and diverse, diversifying to manage the risk. You know, getting those two um, ideas um, in an appropriate balance is, is critical. Sorry, uh, just following you Bishop Rice and, and I apologise, I don't know your name sir. Uh, Don. Don. Shafali, the question is for you. You were talking about the uh, ageing and declining population. I'm from Tasman, so uh, you're using that as an example. Uh, what do you see as the future? Because you talked about irreversible decline. Uh, would you like to yeah, just was... project what that means for us moving forward in 10, 20, 30, 40 years' time? As I said, no, I was talking about irreversible decline rather than a reversible. It's an irreversible decline. So going forward, apart from the fact that there might be massive changes in migration, which is unlikely to happen, as I said, in the sense that uh, going forward, New Zealand is going to be increasingly going to be, there are other developed countries which are also going to be fighting for these young, skilled migrants. The fertility rates, mortality rates are not going to change drastically. The It's not 
it's not going to happen that suddenly we are going to have more babies. So that's, that is an area where the population is not going to grow. The only way the population can grow is through migration. And within migration also, again, as I said, we are going to be in increasing competition with other developed countries to get uh, getting more. So it's more about, I don't know, it's, uh, it's difficult to predict third, but I suppose it's more about creating a more um, kind of vibrant uh, place where young people may want to come and settle because the thing is to increase the decrease the onset of natural decline which is where you have a crossover between having more deaths than more births so to make it a it, it, we need to strive towards an aging uh, a, a youth driven growth rather than a aging driven growth so I suppose that it, I would only say that in terms of policies that have to be policy in place which m make people want to come and stay in a place like Tasman or some other rural areas which currently uh, all migrants which come are always going to go and settle and providing those opportunities for p the migrants to come and settle down in these more rural areas would I think the key. But there's no way that we are going to be able to reverse the fertility uh, trends that are going to happen. So it's only through migration, internal migration as well as uh, international migration that we might be able to change some of the uh, timing of these crossovers, I say, that's going to happen. Thank you for that. Bishop Ross? Uh, my question is on a similar vein. So ah, go Bishop Peter? Uh, Frank, if the trend was uh, bull red meat theory, and you're looking at 2043, you know, there are signs that what the world would want for 2043 is a lot more plant-based food. Uh, do you yet see emerging signs of, of any sort of turn by farmers to grow, for example, the soybean, pea, maize sort of staples or some of those um, vegetarian foods, alternative meat trains and all that stuff? Or are we not yet there yet the same where the emerging trend might be? Um, there's, shall I say, a lot of noise in certain parts of what I'll call the agro food industrial literature. Um, I don't see much um, what I'll call genuine activity at this point in time. But I don't know whether you noticed John Peno, who founder of Sinlay Milk, um, is just um, got some money and is setting up a new company in this area, and um, and I made a little cutting yesterday to about that and to investigate it further because John if you know, has been a very serious entrepreneur, built Sinlay Milk up out of nothing into something very uh, significant. So to me, I see him as the first serious player in the space in NZ. But I have to say that I um, have several research projects in that space going on, more focused not on the production side, but on the market side, what's what the potential really is. I'm working with a, a young scholar that I recruited a few, three years ago, Dr. O Wong. Uh, he did his uh, PhD in Belgium on beer markets and then went to Canada and did a postdoc on um, the export of uh, shellfish and other seafood to Asia. Um, but he's working with me researching demand for plant-based proteins by consumers in different parts of the world. And we've just yesterday we got a, a revise and resubmit on our one of our first articles in that series. So it, it's an emerging area. Um, some people would be much more optimistic than I am. I, I'm not saying that I'm pessimistic, but I'm just sort of quiet realism kind of space at the moment. I guess I'll make a comment about that quickly is that the oats milk factory is, not, is going to happen in Southland and um, going, to, going to produce uh, oat milk from oats which grow pretty well down there and the um, CEO has now been recruited and in place and sort of built a team. 
So that is underway as uh, superfoods, health foods, and associated uh, medicinal products. So multiple innovation taking place there as well. Yep, no, that's a good example. Yeah. Um, one last. Um, I'm wondering, given the increase in automation and in technology in some areas of agriculture, I'm wondering where you see employment growth likely to take place. I, I need to do some further work on that, but I, I guess my philosophical position is that I'm not a Luddite in the sense that I, I believe um, there will always be a demand for people with certain kind of skills, and so that's you could say it's a philosophical bias, but you know, I observe, for instance, some people saying, you know, it's the end of accounting as a profession, and one of my tasks on the side is training accountants. Um, but to me, it's just accountants are doing different kind of things. And it seems to me, even though with artificial intelligence and lots of things, there's, there's still, um, I think, going to be lots of opportunities. But I think it is important that we identify those opportunities and get our training right for them. I think technical education is an area where we haven't done very well in New Zealand for the last 100 years. So it's a big challenge.